Sam Uddam Chet Sam Sam Uddam Chet Sam Yar Ashitas Tirt Padash Yar Ashitas Tirt Padash Chano Yasana Yayaha Chano Yasana
family arrangements, just some of the gathering categories in the song we demonstrated. There's flowers. He took a light bulb and just put it in his hand and it just went like this and the light bulb became like powder. Because most of the power was mostly in the acquiescing of a great amount of strength. And so he thought, oh wow, I don't know, let him continue, we'll make him feel good because he's a guest now. No, we were, some of the devotees were a little curious and see what he can do. And then when we were doing a lot of construction at the time, so he took a rebar, a big, you know, thick, Rebar and just bent it. Just the light, you know. And he said, All right, come and feel my pulse. So the one devotee went over there and couldn't feel anything. He was able to stop his heartbeat. <laughs> so he said, I'm wasting time. <laughs> So he wanted to show off that one. So we let him do it. But the problem was the ground, the, the, the ground was full of ice and he kept slipping. Krishna made a fool out of him. <laughs> After some time he decided to leave. So we got, you know, a little, little taste of what was for some people seemed to be something phenomenal, something great. It was just a waste of time. But when Prabhupada was asked, do you have, do you have any mystic powers? He just pointed to his devotees. He said, these are my mystic powers. He said they were, before they came to Krishna consciousness, they had all bad habits and then he listed certain things that we used to do. He says, now they're chanting Hare Krishna, they're worshiping the Lord, and they're developing all wonderful qualities. This is my mystic power. And that, then when we thought about it, yeah, to actually transform a person's life in such a way that their, their spiritual qualities, their good qualities manifest, is actually a great quality. It's phenomenal to do that. And when Prabhupada was making that point that this is actually greatness, to bring a devotee or a person from the dredges of material life into a position where now the person develops qualities that are conducive to the execution of devotional service. And is kind to everyone and wants to serve the Lord and serve the devotees changes a whole person's life around. So that's real power. And here, of course, what is the source of power? The source of power, just like when Prahlad Maharaj was being harassed by his father, and he tried in so many ways to kill his little son, nothing worked. And let me throw him off, put him in some boiling oil, they all didn't have any effect. Threw him in a pit of snakes. The snakes didn't do anything. He was stabbing him with swords through using his followers. The swords were ineffective. Threw him off a mountain. Krishna was there to catch him. Threw him in an ocean. Threw a mountain on top of him. Didn't have any effect. Prahlad just floated to the top. <laughs> so everything he tried and there was, there's one point, there's one statement in the Hari Bhakta Sudodaya 
where he tried something that's not mentioned in the Bhagavatam, where he got these tantric Brahmins to throw spells on Balad and kill him through mantra. And so they gathered around him in a circle. Prahlad was in the middle, and they started to chant the mantras. But Prahlad was completely absorbed in, uh, on the lotus feet of the Lord. And that's what's illustrated here, the, the, the perfection of life and the success of everything depends on how much one takes shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. And of course, that is, a, that is something that we practice but just by remembering Krishna's lotus feet, everything becomes wonderful. So Prahlad Maharaj was absorbed, and when they, they were throwing mantras, the mantras were bouncing off Prahlad and going back towards the Brahmanas. And the Brahmanas were getting sick, they were getting injured by their own mantras. So what did they do? They said, Prahlad, save us. <laughs> they tried to kill Prahlad, and then when they saw he was ineffectual, and they saw that he was unharmed. Uh, and they were being, they play, prayed to him, you know, if you don't save us, we're finished. So Prahlad, of course, the devotee is by nature non-envious. Even if Prabhupada used to explain, even if somebody tries to do something harmful to a devotee, a devotee doesn't see that person as the instrument of being the uh, it's simply an instrument, but not the person who is actually the cause of one's uh, distress or the propagator of one's distress. Well, the devotee doesn't consider that that person is just a tool in the hands of providence, you might say, in order to either purify the devotee or to uh, uh, to teach the devotee something in Krishna consciousness. So a devotee doesn't blame the perpetrator. And Prabhupada used to say that, don't be disturbed by the instrument of your karma. He would say that, to blame. And that's mentioned in also in the Bhagavatam, when Pariksha Maharaj was questioning the, uh, the bull who was being beaten in the legs by uh, a low-class person he asked him, oh, what is the cause of your suffering? And the bull, being the personification of religion, never identified anyone as the, the cause of one's suffering. He simply presented philosophical points, saying, well, is it, is it, is it karma? It could be karma. Some people say it's karma. Some say it's providence. Some say it's, it's based on certain situations. But he never really blamed anyone, although that person was actually harming him. And then Pariksha Maharaj actually glorified the bull by saying, you are the personification of religion because you understand that the one who blames the perpetrator of an irreligious act also becomes, what we say, affected by the same activity. In other words, you blame someone for causing you harm, you also get a reaction for that, for that blaming. Because that person is actually an instrument, that's all, not the actual perpetrator. So it's interesting. So when Pallad Maharaj heard their prayers, he immediately used his own powers and he retracted the, the effects of the mantras. And these uh, Brahmins were grateful to Prahlad. So a devotee knows nothing but the lotus feet of the Lord. Therefore, uh, the lotus feet of the Lord represents the, the platform of complete satisfaction, peace, happiness, and the process of pure devotional service. So that would takes practice. We have to remember the lotus feet of the Lord. And of course, the manifestation of the lotus feet of the Lord has also come in the form of the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So that, that is synonymous with Krishna's lotus feet. There's no difference. So one who takes shelter of Krishna's lotus feet by chanting the holy names of the Lord 
It's non-different in taking shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Because in the spiritual world, everything is absolute. Therefore, taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord is something we have to practice. <laughs> Remember, by sravanam comes kirtanam, by kirtanam comes smarnam, by smarnam becomes... Uh, one becomes fixed in devotional service. So hearing develops into chanting, chanting develops into memoring, memory when memory becomes full. I think there's five stages of memory. It's explained in the Shastras, different, uh, what we say, degrees of, of concentration up to the point of complete absorption. So that's difficult when you're performing so many activities. But the activities in devotional service are, help, are meant to help us remember the lotus feet of the Lord. And the dangers that we experience or the calamities or just the activities of material life are impetuses for one to remember the lotus feet of the Lord. And you, you, it's like I preach in prisons. And there's people who come forward they get a, they get Srila Prabhupada's books because the books are the main reason why people in prisons become Krishna conscious. After reading the books, they begin chanting, and after some time, they're in a hellish condition. They're in a difficult situation. They're surrounded by a lot of sinful activities. The jails are full of that. Sense gratification, sinful activity, and it's very difficult. <laughs> to, uh, uh, not difficult, practically impossible, to stay fixed in your spiritual life in such an, an atmosphere. But because the atmosphere is so contr contrast, there's such a contrast between Krishna consciousness and the atmosphere, it becomes, in one sense, easier to take shelter of Krishna because of the dangers of that atom. I think it was it... Uh, mm -hmm. How is it? Hmm. Um, there was one inmate, I think, Vaish, you know him really good. Brother Balaban Nimita, yeah, yeah. We were both writing him. He took shelter of uh, Vaisheshika and became his uh, disciple. But he wrote me one letter one time. And he, he, he surprised himself. <laughs> in that letter he explains how uh, he was out in, because they, they let the inmates out outside and they, do, they run around and they do gymnastics. And they're more or less in a group. And they're, of course they're monitored, but they're in a group. So one day he was out there and one fellow inmate came up to him and said, Are you uh, Ben Baker? And he said, Yes. He said, you killed my best friend. And then he attacked him immediately. Now, Ben is powerful. <laughs> the guy is really powerful. So for him, it was nothing. But he didn't do anything. And he just grabbed the person, put him down until the guards came and took him away. And he wrote me and he said, I surprised myself. He said, normally in that situation, I would have finished him off. <laughs> But because of Lord Nityananda's mercy, <laughs> he, he, gave, he gave credit to Lord Nityananda. And he said, yeah, because of Lord Nityananda's mercy, I surprised myself. I didn't really do anything to harm him. So, yeah, that's the power of Krishna consciousness, how it transforms even the most, what we say, difficult. There was one person I was... We were preaching in jail in one country in in Europe. Not in Europe, but actually it's in Asia. It's a country we're not allowed to preach in. So I won't mention the name, but maybe you know. And we had one devotee who became a, what is it called, a chaplain within the jail. And at one point he asked the, the administrators, do you have anybody here who's practicing Hinduism? He's a Hindu Indian background. They said, yeah, actually he's on death row. 
Okay, well, we have a regular Bhagavad Gita class. We would like to, you know, invite him to learn Bhagavad Gita. So they sent him, and he came. He had about two weeks before he was supposed to be executed. I mean, he was up for capital punishment. And, uh, and he was completely denying the charge against him. His parents would come. He said, I was, you know... I didn't do it, you know, it wasn't me, we would blame somebody else or the circumstance. And then he started regularly taking Bhagavad Gita lessons and reading Bhagavad Gita, and he became interested, and he became one of the best students in the class after a while. And then he was really enjoying and also becoming, he was actually learning verses. And at one point he actually admitted, yes, I did make the crime. <laughs> He became honest just by, you know, his exposure to the philosophy. And then, of course, after some time, it was time for him to go for his execution. So he asked the jailers, can you allow me to carry Bhagavad Gita with me when you take me away because I want to have Bhagavad Gita in my next life. I want to be a devotee in my next life. So... <laughs> They thought it was unusual, but, but they said, all right, yeah, no problem. So <laughs> he took the Bhagavad Gita, and they were, you know, carrying him away, walking him. And he's passing by the different jail cells, and he's seeing some of his fellow inmates, and he's just waving to him, goodbye, I'm going to be a devotee of Krishna in my next life. And the, the jailers were just amazed. Nobody goes like that. They already have to drag him, usually. <laughs> He was just, you know, waving to everyone, saying, goodbye, I'm going to be a devotee in my next life. <laughs> and so they let him keep the Gita all the way up to the end. <laughs> so, yeah, and then they came to us, they come to the devotee who was the Hindu chaplain. What did you, what did you do to him? <laughs> what is the secret? What happened? <laughs> they wanted to know. We just explained, well, you know, when you learn about God and you depend on God, then you become free from fear, you know. And then you understand that, you know, that this is not just one life. You can become, in your next life, you can be a good devotee of God. So, of course, I don't know if they understood it, but anyway, <laughs> that's what we explained. So, the, the transformation of... Um, Devotee, a person who become devotee is just a, a phenomenal. And one who remembers the lotus feet of the Lord is uh, situated on the, the platform of beyond the modes of material nature. And there are many, many wonderful examples. And I think practically most of our devotees in our society have become what we say, purified simply by chanting Hare Krishna, reading Srila Prabhupada's books, and uh, taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. And chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is no different. It's non-different than remembering the lotus feet of the Lord. Um, there was two devotees who were sent to by Srila Prabhupada in, this was in 1970, one or 72. They were in India and Prabhupada sent them to Bangladesh at the time. And there was a war at the time. A war between you know, West Pakistan and East Pakistan, of course, at that time. That's, the whole geography has changed since then. But the area was Bangladesh. And two sannyasis, one was Brahmananda and another, I can't remember the other sannyasi. They were there, they were asked to preach there. And so after some time, Prabhupada was getting a little worried because uh, the war was escalating and was becoming more dangerous. So Prabhupada was trying to reach them to call him back, but the communications broke down. And so Prabhupada was praying for him. So finally, some of the local people said, you better leave, you know, it's getting really dangerous here. So they decided to leave. And the Islamic army, who was more or less in control, was providing buses for immigrants to, to, leave, the, to leave the country. But <clears throat> there was, they would provide the buses, and then when the buses would come to the border, they would check and see who was on the buses. And if there was any Hindus, <laughs> they would take them off and execute them. So here's these two sannyasis. <laughs> 
and they come to the border and they recognize them. I think they were dressed in their, I don't know whether they were dressed in, I don't think they were dressed in, you know, our, you know, you know, uh, devotee clothes. But they recognized them as being Hindus and as being preachers there. So they took them off, put them in front of a firing squad, and then they were going to execute them. And Brahmananda all of a sudden got excited. He held up his beads and he started to chant really loudly. And he said, hey, we're going back to Godhead. <laughs> we're going back to Godhead. And he was like smiling and waving his beads and just chanting as loud as he could. And the other sannyasi got the message and he joined in. And then the Islamic army got bewildered. And the, the leader came up and said, all right, get on the bus and get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so do you believe in magic? <laughs> or Krishna's lotus feet? <laughs> Which is personified in the, in the form of the holy name. So yeah, it is, um, so do you, we're, we're speaking about wonderful feats, and so devotees have devotees do wonderful feats because they change devote, they change ordinary people into you know lovers of Krishna. That is that is the mystic power, and so Prabhupada is really, in one sense, he glorifies Kadamba Muni for his greatness, but but he's really glorifying him for his actual position in devotional service. And when so, someone said to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you are the best of all devotee. Prabhupada said, devotee? Oh, devotee. That's very high. <laughs> oh, devotee. Yeah. So Prabhupada gave us a little deeper understanding, or maybe a complete understanding of what it means to be a devotee. It's not a small thing. <laughs> to become, you know, a servant of the Supreme Lord, actually to regain that position, is a, is a great achievement to come to that position. And of course, the process is there, but, you know, so we have to remain fixed, and of course, to remain fixed in Krishna consciousness means to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and to associate with devotees in the mood of serving, serving the devotees. That's how, that is the essence of our practice of Krishna consciousness. And Krishna's lotus feet are always there, they're always visible, they're always, in, and simply by thinking of Krishna, simply by Krishna's own lotus feet, then the material world dissolves, and then one is no longer affected by the three form miseries. Now this is the mercy of the Lord, this is the mercy of this, the pure devotees who give us the opportunity. At Kardama Muni, he was surrounded by opportunities for unlimited sense enjoyment. But he wasn't affected. He said he was enjoying with his wife. The Prabhupada uses that word, enjoying. He was not just with his wife. He was in, in, in an enjoying state. And he wanted to give her pleasure. Devahuti had performed so many austerities. She denied her herself. She was a daughter of, of Swayambhuva Manu. Because of her position, she was, she was accustomed to luxury and royalty. And uh, now, being married to a, a great tapasya, <laughs> tapasi, she didn't want to uh, display that mood, and so she took on a lot of austerities to be subordinate in the mood of a, of a wife to the husband, and in order to please him also. And he appreciated that, and she emaciated herself so much that he was really a, really wanted to... Uh, reward her for, in, in some way, for all of the uh, personal austerities she performed in order to serve him nicely. And so uh, he created this, uh, this aerial mansion which flew everywhere just to give her uh, a taste of royal happiness. <laughs> and so that was his kindness. And But he was unaffected. And of course, ultimately, he gave her the Supreme Personality of Godhead as, as, his, as her son. And that was the greatest gift he could have gave her because she, after losing, not losing, but his hurt, he decided that he had uh, completed his responsibilities in Grihasa life, now he wanted to move on. 
And so, but he left her with his gift. That was the opportunity for her to become purified by having the Supreme Personality of Godhead as her son. And not only that, he stayed with her and she asked many questions. That is the, the essence of the rest of this third canto. The uh, questions that she asked to her son and how he answered them. And then she, ultimately she became purified also. So, thank you very much for being here. Any questions or comments on anything? Thank you, Vaisheshika. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Raj. That was a yes. beautiful class. About the Avatar Prabhu, right? Hare Krishna. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned some of the great experiences that you've witnessed of individuals being transformed by Christian consciousness. But during this festival, um, I think all of us probably witnessed the amazing effect that Christian consciousness can have on the whole world just by us coming together and performing this Sankirtan. We were in the Sunday night when the kirtan was going on, all the people were just dancing in, in total ecstasy. It was unbelievable. Rathiatra? No, it's Sunday night, the night after Rathiatra. And the Rathiatra was also really amazing, totally amazing. You could really feel the, the, the potency of the the synergy of all the devotees came together which just producing a mega just purifying the whole universe. And then Sunday night in, in the temple and it was just concentrated because everybody was chanting together in one place. The chanting of the Holy Name in a congregational way not only purifies the chanter and even in the immediate area, but it, it, it builds it, it actually emanates itself outward. And when Krishna is pleased, everything becomes wonderful. So that is the way to please Krishna. We chant for purification, we chant for, to give others the mercy, but the main reason we chant is to please the Supreme Person, Godhead. Because it's the essence of how to glorify the Lord in this age. If Krishna is pleased, then everyone benefits. Even the non-devotees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even yeah. demons. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna and Sri Prabhupada were definitely pleased. So nice that we can all come together and have these festivals and produce such a spectacular effect on purifying the whole world consciousness. There's nothing more powerful than the holy name. Yeah. The holy name. When you, we, we, we say, you know, the holy name is not different than Krishna. But what does that actually mean? <laughs> we understand it, at least in principle. But how much can you understand in terms of it, what, are, what it actually is the essence of that statement? That means Krishna is personally present. And when he's personally present, everything becomes transformed. I've seen, you know, people who all of a sudden they're chanting and all of a sudden they're in a different world. The chanting of the Holy Name, there's one story, uh, you know, this, this happened in Iskand, two, two temple presidents, and they had some problems with each other. <laughs> And they weren't talking. And uh, you might say they were at, at odds with each other in a very strong way. So they weren't talking. But somehow they showed up at the same kirtan program. And so they were all together and the kirtan was going on. Devotees were dancing. There was a circle. And so one very senior devotee, he understood that he knew both of them. He 
were at odds with each other. So he grabbed one of them, started dancing with him. <laughs> and then he was dancing in the middle of the circle with him. And then he gradually, very strategically, started to move towards the other person who was on the other side of the circle. And then when he got to him, he pulled him in. And the, then the three of them were dancing together. <laughs> uh, cool. And then this devotee left, and the two of them were still dancing together. <laughs> they forgot all about their problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the holy name, yeah. What's that problem I had? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I can't remember. What, 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 was, what was that problem? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Hare Krishna. <laughs> Everything goes that becomes transformed. Jiva <laughs> Chwabi tells a similar story that they used to have twelve hour kirtan at the Sri Prabhupada ordered like twelve hour kirtan at the Juhu temple. And so they they do it on Sunday. And so someone would come with them to a problem like on, you know, Thursday or Friday, he'd say, oh, okay, you know, we'll, we'll just settle it, you know, Monday. So then after the 12 hour care time, they'd come, they'd say, there was no problems. Yeah. They'd, just like you said, they'd forget about what, what, the, what was the problem again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The problem is we're not chanting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> Yeah, there was, uh, I was just thinking of something. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for the lovely class. Um, that story with Brahmananda and the other devotee when they were... Yeah, that's uh, classic. I've heard it many times. Amazing. And I think well, um, it is one of many similar incidents in this society. How the whole thing becomes reversed as soon as one takes shelter of Krishna, hmm. everything changes. So my my question relates to that. As we say, as you said, there's many situations like that we've heard about, um, especially when they're at really close to the point of death and fully surrendering to Krishna. But um, in that situation, I have a more clear understanding of what surrender means. But uh, in, the, in our daily life, in my daily process of devotional service, of trying to serve devotees and um, you know, just trying to practice Krishna consciousness, I sometimes forget what surrender looks like in a daily, um, in a daily schedule. I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate. What is surrender? Bhakti yeah. Siddhanta Saraswati says, surrender is a moment-to-moment -moment process. It's not something you do and then it's complete. Surrender means, how can I serve the Supreme Personality of God at, a, at every moment? One should always be thinking, how can I serve? And of course, if we have our prescribed duties, then we follow that. But sometimes there's always, there may also be gaps. So. And then we, and then Maya will, and Maya, when Maya sees a gap in your schedule, she'll try to, and she knows your weak spot, and she knows where you're most vulnerable, and then she'll present something that you maybe can use in getting involved with. But the devotee would always thinks, well, okay, I'm not doing anything now. I can always chat. I can always read. I can always find something to keep myself engaged somehow in devotional service. And that way, maya cannot come in. Prabhupada was used to say, when you're engaged in devotional service, then, you know, maya stands back. <laughs> she can't do anything. Because devotional service is, is more powerful. That's why Prabhupada would say, maya has to go on the backside of Krishna. She's embarrassed. She can't. So if you keep Krishna in the front, then Maya is behind. But if you don't keep Krishna in the front, then Maya is in the front. <laughs> so that means keeping oneself engaged in devotional service. Thinking about Krishna, worshipping Krishna, offering obeisances, Krishna, manmana bhava madbhakta, mam yuji mam namaskaru. 
Krishna gives the four ways that he is actually remembered in the Bhagavad Gita, and Prabhupada em emphasized that this is the essence of the practice of Krishna consciousness. To always remember Krishna, to engage in devotional service, to worship the Lord, and to offer full, uh, obeisances to the Lord. These are the four complete processes of bhakti. And that expands out to the different services we do. And so, as soon as the mind is not focused on something devotional, Maya is there <laughs> to remind you, oh yeah, didn't you want to go see that movie? <laughs> Don't you remember that person said something bad about you? You should get even. <laughs> Maya is always remembering, reminding us about what we once wanted to do but no longer are doing. <laughs> That's Maya. Yeah. So surrender is a moment-to-moment -moment thing. It's not something that we just complete. Well, I'm surrendered. Oh, yeah, what are you doing? Well, I'm... Uh, hmm. You know, I'm watching a movie. <laughs> what is the movie about? Well, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> Maybe I can learn something and use it in my devotional service. <laughs> so we're in this... Maybe engage in this process and we want to stay in this process so my question is what's an easy way to stay in remembrance of Krishna I'm thinking that if we have respect for the devotees who are following this process we automatically get the mercy of Krishna am I correct in saying that yeah when you respect someone you appreciate them and to appreciate the association of devotees is the foundation by which we can execute our devotional service. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoi, Lovamatta Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Everything really centers around the association of devotees. All the activities we perform are in the association of devotees. And that gives support and enthusiasm and purification for the activities. Everything is there. And so hearing and association of devotees, chanting, worshiping, serving. And uh, the mood is, in the association of devotees, the mood is not what I can get from that association, but what can I contribute to that in that association? In other words, what can I do to serve? And that's, that's the mood. Sometimes all we can do is just hear. That is also, if we're actually serious about hearing in that association, that is also devotional service. But other times we have opportunities to perform service. And of course, it's mentioned in the uh, Nectar of Instructions, the six loving exchanges between Vaishnavas to reveal one's confidential thoughts, to hear one's confidential thoughts, to give a gift, to receive a gift, to offer prasadam, and to accept prasadam. Prabhupada writes that these six loving exchanges are the foundation by which I decided to establish temples. He said the temple worship program was to facilitate these six loving exchanges between the devotees. Mm -hmm. Which is the foundation for community and for, you know, successful execution of devotional service. You can see when you're with the non-devotees, you may be doing something on the outside, and then when you're with devotees, the whole, uh, it's a whole different experience. You have to fight to keep your Krishna consciousness when you're out there, <laughs> so you don't fall into 
you know, allurements, or you may just, you know, become a little routine and start to appreciate the material energy again. And if you start looking at the material energy in a positive way, then you know, you're, you're losing your understanding of actually what Krishna says, Dukalayam Masasratam. That's what it is. It's miserable and temporary. So, yeah, when we see the dichotomy of the experiences between associating with devotees and having to interact with the non-devotees, it's a whole different thing. But if you're very strong in your Krishna consciousness, then you're not affected even in that association. But, you know, we can't somehow think we were, we're so strong. <laughs> we may be. And we may be unaffected. Here, Kardama Muni is not only enjoying with his wife, but with many other women, but it says he was above material condition life. And so he wasn't affected by that. So that's the that's what it means to be, make advancement, not to become disturbed by the happiness and distress or the attractions and distractions that come by way of living in this material world. When I mean, the other night we were doing was it Forty Second Street when we were doing that Kirtan program was it Friday night? You know, just look around you know, all of these huge gigantic, monstrous, I don't know what you call them, you know, displays flashing right in front of us. And, you know, you get distracted once in a while and see something, but then you think, well, what a waste of time. <laughs> and then you go back to chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> and then, so devotees, you know, can be in that atmosphere, but not so much affected by it. My Prabhupada would say, you know, my is as strong as you are weak. Hmm. Anything else? Yeah. What time do we have to end? Nine? What time is it now? 9.05. Oh, yeah, everybody has their services, and of course, yeah. So I want to continue. So thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Kita.